Good morning. <laughs> so good to see everybody here this Sunday morning. And even though it's sort of dreary outside, it's always sunny when we come into the house of the Lord to worship. And we want to welcome all of those that are watching online with us as well this morning. Would you please stand for the call to worship? <clears throat> when the disciples were on the boat in the midst of the storm, where was Jesus? When we are going through trials and troubles, where is Jesus? He's always there, praying for and watching us, ready to come with grace to help. Amen. Stay standing. Uh, here we be singing, I'm not. Uh, but anyway, his eyes on the spirit. <laughs>
Please join me in the opening prayer. Loving God, we thank you for being with us always, lifting, healing, restoring, and encouraging us to on our journey life with you. You are always faithful to watch out for us and supply all our needs in every situation, no matter how difficult or sorrowful. Help us, O oh God, to remember that you are praying for us always, giving us unshakable hope and unending love. Empower us to live in hope and love exceedingly, so others will behold and follow Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. The epistle lesson today comes from Romans, the eighth chapter, verses 26 through 34. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that every spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called, and those whom he called, he also justified, and those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died. Yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who, who indeed intercedes for us. Good morning, Epworth. Good morning. And welcome to worship on a glorious day. Every day the Lord gives us is glorious. But this is a special day of the week that God has set aside just for you, to, for us to enjoy Him and worship Him. You know, we're consuming and receiving blessings all the time during the week. This is the one hour that is dedicated completely to giving back to God praise that he is so worthy of. So thank you for coming to worship our good and glorious God, being with us in person and online. Uh, all of you are very much a part of our worship because we're connected through the Holy Spirit and we pray together. We pray for God's kingdom to come upon us and his blessings and love and joy and grace that we might live more boldly for him. I do want to uh, lift up a few of the announcements here before we go into our blessings and concerns. And uh, I understand uh, a lot of our wrestlers did well in the state tournament, so we give God praise for that. And we have one uh, from our church, uh, Brock Matson, and uh, he uh, did well, placed. And, uh, of course, that's the grandson of Louise and David Rains. And uh, we rejoice with them and the Matson family. We do want to um, uh, look at our announcements here. And uh, there's several there that have been there a while. There, you've uh, been made aware of them. But I've been asked to lift up uh, the United Methodist Women. They have a special day of prayer and self-denial coming up on the 14th at Calvary. Uh, the details are there, so hopefully you'll make that a uh, part of your week on next Monday. We know that uh, uh, one thing that's not in there, you got an email on it. General conference has been postponed till uh, the 2024 conference. There's just no way we could get half of our delegates here from around the world because of the COVID uh, problems and visas. They can't get visas to get in. So if half of our church can't meet, there's no way that we could have it this summer. So it will hopefully take place at the next appointed time in 2024. Uh, one thing in your bulletin, too, is uh, this extra insert. One's about uh, hospitality on 
uh, Sunday evenings, how you can help uh, Lisa and uh, all of us uh, with that worship. But on the back side is Rise Up with Jesus. This is a great opportunity that's coming to us. Uh, Beth Miller and Mary Jane Anderson are working hard on this. You can see the needs. We need a few more volunteers. We need, what, three, about three more uh, to help out. We just need you to be a part. If you can help in any of the ways listed here by being present or giving to one of these uh, areas, uh, the sign-up sheet is out in the narthex. And uh, those of you watching on Facebook, you can just uh, leave a message there. You want to help? Uh, so, again, you're a part of what we do. And uh, tonight you don't want to miss because um, you've heard in Ripley there, there's uh, some sisters called the Sold Sisters. Well, we've got our own brand of sisters here. They're called the Food Sisters. <laughs> and that's... Uh, Paula Casto and uh, Patana Whiting, they run our food ministry here, and they're going to share a little bit about that in our evening service, so you won't want to miss that uh, tonight. Uh, we also have uh, other meetings listed there that are coming up, so please pay attention to them, as well as you can give to the meals. We have free meals every Sunday evening, so come and eat with us in fellowship as well. Uh, you are a part of this through your prayers, uh, your presence, and your giving. We are doing more this year than last year, and that's great. We want to move forward for Christ, uh, to build up the church and reach more people for Christ. Well, you, you're a part of that whenever you pray, uh, whenever you give, and there are different ways you can give. Those of you watching online can still give online. Uh, there, it shows you there on the screen how to do that. You can uh, text, you can use the QR code that, that's there on your screen, um, as well as send something to the church. So thank you for your gifts, your prayers, your participation to uh, bring the presence, the blessings of Christ, not just among us, but out into the community and into the world. Um, when you give, if you want to give uh, to help uh, in Ukraine, United Methodists are there. We're always there because we're a part of a global church. The United Methodist Committee on Relief is in Poland helping with refugees. If you want to give a little extra, mark that on your gift to um, Ukraine. We'll make sure uh, that money gets there. So we have... Uh, uh, blessings. I mentioned the blessings of the wrestler. Any other joys or blessings we want to celebrate today? We do have a lot of concerns, and um, one of those is uh, Walter Booker. I don't think he will be with us much longer. He is nearing death. His family is in. Uh, hospice is there. We want to lift up uh, Walter and the Booker family as he prepares to go to his eternal rest. Uh, Fred Batten and his son Ron are not doing very well. We want to lift them up, as well as Retta Kasdorf, who had hoped to be here today, but uh, just is having too much pain. We want to pray uh, that God will relieve her of that pain. We still are praying for healing as well. Uh, continue to pray for uh, Janet Stroll, uh, Mike Tillinghast, um, many of you are praying for a young woman, not a part of our congregation, but many of you know her, Brandy Anderson Thompson with uh, tongue cancer. Who is she still at UK? Um, you know she's still there? Okay, and she's got more treatments and surgeries coming up. Um, our own Claudia Chancy needs prayer. Steve has indicated that she's having trouble walking, and uh, so pray for Claudia. Uh, I also have the uh, Dr. John Pearson family, Charles Wooten family, and then there has been a request for uh, Rob Wooten. Any others that uh, I have not listed or we don't have on our prayer list? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we're thankful that you have your eye on on the sparrows, all of creation, but especially upon uh, your children, sons and daughters of God through Jesus Christ. And that's how we come before you today. Uh, Lord, you have made us worthy through him. 
even though we fall short and we're thankful for your grace and forgiveness and, and how we get to experience that at the table today uh, through the loaf and the cup, uh, what a great opportunity to experience more of the amazing grace that you just continue to pour out uh, unceasingly, unconditionally. We're, we don't really understand what unconditional love is like because we can't do that on our own. But we're thankful that you do it for us because so often we are not deserving, but you are forgiving and you are faithful and we're thankful to know you, great and glorious that you are, loving and compassionate and ever-present. And we're thankful for a Savior like Jesus who not only limited himself in becoming human, but is now before the right hand of you almighty God praying for us praying for things that we aren't even aware of praying for this this week upcoming week and we don't know what's ahead but you do and we're just thankful for a savior loving us like that and praying for us we're grateful to be able to celebrate our joys but also each and every concern uh, you uh know all the details you know what is needed we pray for the grace to help each one that we have named here this morning even the unspoken requests in our heart and our hearts are broken as as are most of the world as we uh, watch the uh, horrible events taking place in ukraine we pray O oh lord for protection of the ukrainian people we pray for peace we pray even for the russians that they might uh, wake up to the need to make peace and to uh, know uh, your will. And we just pray that uh, you'll work through people as you choose to do, to end the conflict and establish justice and peace. Thank you for how they are inspiring us and uniting us to, to work for the things that make for peace. Help us, Lord, to be as courageous and bold as they are in protecting their country. May we be that for our faith and uh, for our loved ones and the values that we hold as well as our nation. We're thankful that we are one nation under God. May we continue to experience that unity to break down the, the dividing walls that separate us, to work for peace and what is right, your will above our own, above politics, above all else. So come, Lord Jesus, we pray. Bring your healing love to individuals as well as to the nations. And we pray boldly, thank you, that you are over all and with all through Christ, in whose name we pray. And pray as he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The children would join me on the steps, please. Oh, golly, we are small in numbers today, right? And I bet we're mighty, aren't we? Oh, we even have a baby up here. And, oh, we have a special guest this morning, don't we, Cameron? 
Cameron, you want to show them your bear? This, this is a special guest. This, can I hold him? This is the prayer bear from church, the preschool, Church of Christ Preschool. And once a month, I think, or something like that, there's a, ch a student chosen to take the prayer bear home with them. And it was Cameron's turn this week. So she brought her to church with her. And then she'll tell her, her uh, class. There you go, sweetie. Tell her class all about our church, won't you? All right. Well, I have been trying to think what we're going to talk about. And I want you guys to look at all these pencils I have here today. I've got all kinds of pencils. Look at them. These pencils were on my seat when I came into choir about a month ago. I immediately, I looked at Sue Overmiller and I said, Sue, did you bring me the pencils? She's always bringing me goodies, but she did not bring me the pencils. There's a bunch of them. There's all kinds, brand new pencils. And I thought they were all so pretty and I wasn't sure if they were mine or not. Nobody in the choir brought them, they said. Nobody has owned up to them. So I put them up here on the kneeling altar thinking somebody come back for the pencils, but they didn't. So guess what? I took them. <laughs> They're mine now, I decided. So whoever brought them, we appreciate the pencils. I really thought maybe they left them for me to give to you. So I got to thinking about pencils and people and Jesus. What do they have in common? Goodness, let's see. I've got this pencil. It doesn't have much of a racer on it. It's kind of sharpened. I've got a bigger pencil here. It's nice and big and round. Then I've got one that doesn't have any erasers on them and no lead at all. Then I've got these really nice, new, shiny pencils. I love shiny pencils when they're sharpened, don't you? But what do they all have in common? What do all these pencils, these brand, brand new pencils have in common? Well, you have to sharpen them. But what else do they have? What's on top? An eraser. So if I'm going to write something and I make a mistake, what do I do? Just turn that pencil over and erase that mistake, right? That's easy to do, isn't it? Well, when I start thinking about these pencils with an eraser, I thought, well, gosh, there's just all kinds of them. And, you know, it's kind of like people. You know, there's all kinds of people, isn't there? There's little teeny tiny people. Some a little bigger. Hmm, some have erasers, some don't. My eyes are blue. You girls, I think, have brown eyes. My hair's kind of gray, and yours is pretty nice brown hair. <laughs> so, hmm, Jesus and papal and pencils. Well, what do you think happens if we always have Jesus in our heart, right? What do you think happens if we make a mistake? What do we need to do? We need to erase it, but we need some help to erase it. What should we do? Who should we ask to help us? Jesus, that's right. Good job, Cameron. <laughs> Jesus. Yes, we should ask Jesus. So, you know, God sent Jesus to the cross just to erase those sins for us. That's pretty cool, isn't it? So, if we make a mistake, we just say, dear Jesus, help us make this right. Do you think he'll help us? Yes, he will. I know he will. So you remember the next time you're doing your math homework or whatever kind of work you have to do, you make a mistake, you just erase it. And if you make a mistake some other time, maybe you do something that's not like you're not very nice to your brother or sister. Maybe you didn't clean up your room. You just say, please, Jesus, help me do better. And guess what? He'll help you do better. I promise. So, I'm going to give you guys pencils today. And, you know, I'm going to give you some extra ones. And if you know somebody that you think needs reminded, maybe you could give them a pencil too. Is that a good idea? All right. Well, let's say a little prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus, your son, to erase our mistakes. Help us to always remember, no matter how bad things get, you will help us make it better. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. You have some pencils.
God not only delivered Daniel, he will deliver us, won't he? If you uh, are thankful for that, then stand up with me with our gospel lesson and read with me from Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side. While he dismissed the crowds, and after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat battered by the waves was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately... Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got inside the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. Please be seated. As you came in, hopefully many of you got one of these cards. It's really an invitation for you to invite people to Epworth, to any of our services between now and Easter. And uh, so get some extra, uh, invite your friends and neighbors you know don't have a church home. Let them know that they'll be blessed when they come here. Uh, God will will come and, and bless their lives. So these are out in the narthex and take as many as you need. Let us pray. Oh God, we're just thankful that you come to us. Help us to perceive your presence right now. To hear your voice. And to know more of your grace through the word and words that you give us today. Speak through our thoughts and my words together. May they be acceptable in your sight. You who are our strength and redeemer. And we ask these things in the name of the one who is the word that became flesh. Amen. Have any of you seen one of those Where's Waldo books? If you've had kids or grandkids, you probably have. Uh, I used to love to look at Where's Waldo uh, with my kids. And uh, you would... um, see these pages with huge crowds of people and objects and and try to find out where Waldo was hiding there, right there in plain sight. Do you see where he is? (laughs) It takes some doing, doesn't it, to find him. It's not so easy because Waldo blends in uh, with everybody else. And you have to train your eyes and your brain to lock in on the particular features of Waldo, and that makes it easier to find him. Sometimes I think it's like that with Jesus. We can wonder, where's Jesus when you need him? I mean, I don't think he's here right now. He couldn't be nearby, or I wouldn't be going through this difficult 
situation or this suffering. If, if Jesus was here, surely I would find relief or it would be prevented. And the disciples were much the same way. Often they were wondering, where's Jesus when you need him? And in Matthew 14, we see that they're unable to get across the Sea of Galilee because the wind is buffeting up against them. The waves were fierce against their little boat. Now, the winds, if you've been to uh, the Sea of Galilee or you've read about it, could be really fierce and the waves could be crushing. Uh, they had great storms on this sea and could easily capsize these little fishing boats. The word for buffeted is an interesting word. I, I just thought I'd look it up. And it, it uh, is a Greek word, uh, basanizo, which means to be tortured and tormented in pain. That's a much stronger word than I expected for uh, waves buffeting up against a boat. Tortured, tormented. This is a word that was used with the demoniac that Jesus confronted that was being tortured. It's a very powerful word here that conveys the most horrible of experiences. They're filled with, with fear and stress and anguish, including the straining of the oars. Often when we come to Jesus, we, like the disciples, can think, well, we ought to get a free pass on all of these uh, storms in life. And uh, when we get into one, a difficulty or suffering, uh, we think, well, okay, Jesus ought to at least come as a superman here and blow the storm away and just make things right. I mean, I, I've committed my life to Jesus. There ought to be some extra benefit by doing that. Well, when we start to see Jesus like that as a superman or a magician or a genie who can just come in and, and uh, make things go away easily, we'll begin to tend to think when the suffering comes, why me, Lord? I mean, this shouldn't be happening to me. Why me? Are you singling me out? Did I do something I didn't know I did to offend you? Well, even the disciples began to think that. They were confused. They were doubting and wondering, where is Jesus? Because we're left out here all by ourselves to, to, to fend for ourselves He's nowhere to be found. Even more troubling, if you look at the scripture here, even more troubling is that Jesus sent them out on the water without him. It's almost as if he intentionally puts them out there without him being there. Right before this scripture, Jesus has just fed the 5,000 and he's been dismissing them. It says, he immediately made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side. Jesus put them in harm's way. Now, that's just hard to imagine. I, I think Jesus knew what was going to happen. And um, he puts them out there. He's not there. What they could not see, and they should have known, when Jesus would disappear, where would Jesus be usually? He'd be off praying, wouldn't he? They knew where Jesus would be if they couldn't find him. He would be with his heavenly father. You remember in the scripture when Jesus as a 12-year-old boy disappeared after they'd been at the Passover in Jerusalem? Where was he? He was in the temple with his heavenly father. If you can't see Jesus at the time, you know he's off praying somewhere. And who's he praying for? He's praying for you. If you can't see him, you know he's praying for you. And that's exactly what he was doing with the disciples. He, was, he knew where they were. He was watching them from the mountaintop. He could see onto the Sea of Galilee. And he was praying for them. But they'd forgotten about that. They had forgotten what they had just learned. If you go back to chapter 10 in Matthew, Jesus told them that God's always watching out for you. He's watching over you and everything that happens to you. It doesn't uh, catch him by surprise. It may catch us by surprise. And he told them in chapter 10, don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. God watches over them. He watches over you. But they hadn't learned yet, had they? They hadn't learned 
to train their minds and their hearts to see the presence of Jesus um, that seemed hidden to them at the time. They had the understanding that if Jesus was there, they ought to get a free pass on trouble. No, I follow Jesus. There ought not be any trouble in my life or at least have an easier way out. That's the sign, isn't it? A lot of people think, well, if Jesus is there, it ought to, he ought to show up and make things easy. That's not it. They had to retrain their minds and thinking. The promise Jesus gives us, we've got to read the scriptures carefully. Many people have an image of Jesus that's different from scripture. They, they want Jesus to be this way. Well, he's just going to be who he is, and scripture tells us that. He doesn't promise us a pain-free life. He doesn't promise us a trouble-free life. Even he was not spared suffering. Or rejection. How can we expect that we're going to be? God did not even spare his own son. And this is the promise. John chapter 16. In the world, you will have tribulation. Oh, I don't want that promise. But, but, there's a but. Be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. That's the promise. Not a problem free life but a savior who has overcome a savior who will be with you always a savior who is praying for every need and concern in your life that's the promise the promise is uh, an assurance that even though we have many trials Jesus is going to be greater than the trials and he will come And his grace will be sufficient because he is praying. Nothing happens to us that Jesus is not unaware of or outside of his care and concern. Right now, he's praying for you. I don't know all the things going on in your life, everything that's on your plate, but he does, and he is praying for you right now. Picture that. Right now, he is praying for you at the right hand of God to give us peace and assurance. We so much want God's ways to be our ways, but, but they usually aren't. And his timing is rarely according to our calendars. There are delays that are hard to understand, and I, I can't pretend to understand what it's like when you have some delays and hardships. They are hard to understand. Remember, Jesus' good friends, Mary and Martha, had a hard time understanding when their, their brother Lazarus was sick. Remember, they're close friends with Jesus. They felt like, well, you know, if anybody's got an edge or an advantage with Jesus we do we're, we're close friends but not even they had an extra advantage over us or anyone and they begged Jesus to come and heal their brother but what does Jesus do he intentionally delays oh they were upset we all would be right he delayed and when Jesus gets there Lazarus has already been dead Four days. Four days. He's in the tomb. And before Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, he said, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Jesus is always working for something greater and better than we can imagine, than our particular answer that we want It's not always centered on us. It's not always about us. And it's not always when we want it. Because Jesus has something bigger in mind. The kingdom of God coming on earth. Everybody else too. And how it affects them. And everything. Everything is for the glory of God. Greater than anything else in life, I believe, is the glory of God. Of God. What could be greater than for you or me to behold 
the glory of God. That's what Jesus wants us to see is the glory of God. And that happens when we trust him in the storm. It's easy on the sunny days. It's tough in the storm. Give the disciples credit. You got to give them credit here that they didn't turn back when the going got tough. I don't know. I see this storm. Hey, we better go back and wait till it passes. No, they keep on going. Jesus sent them out there. They're going to keep on going. They persevered even with their doubts and fears. And I think that is a good example for us to never give up on Jesus. Never give up on him. Always keep trusting. Always keep praying and looking to him and watching and even waiting. As Isaiah chapter 40 declares, those who persevere and wait on the Lord will have their strength renewed. They will mount up with wings like eagles and soar on the wind of God's spirit. Amen. God does that. The storms don't always go away either when we want. Notice that when Jesus came out, the storm's still um, raging. It, it doesn't stop. He's right there in the storm. It didn't stop. Peter comes out and walks on the water in the storm, and it's, the wind's so great, he, he, he can't keep his eye. He looks at the wind. That's when he starts to sink. The storm doesn't disappear, and they had been at it all night. They'd gone hour after hour. Jesus, where are you? Hour after hour. Have you been through a long night waiting? You know, you, you've got a crisis going on. You've got a loved one that's sick. And you're waiting through that night. And it just goes on and on. And you wonder, Jesus, where are you? Come and help. He's there in the storm, just like he was with Peter and the rest of them. The storm didn't disappear. But something he does do before he even comes to us in the storm, he's been praying. He'd already been praying, interceding for them on the mountain before he comes out to them in the storm. And he's urging the Holy Spirit to help us. One thing the disciples didn't have at that time. They, they didn't have the Holy Spirit, but we do. That came at Pentecost. They had it then, and Jesus sends the Holy Spirit. That's so good to know because when we're out there fighting the wind and waves of life, you never have to do it alone. He comes in the spirit and he stands up for us at the right hand of God. You remember the story in Acts chapter 7 when Stephen was being martyred for his faith. I mean, he's been faithful. He's done everything right and he's getting stoned to death. And we don't know all the things that God was doing at that time. We do know there was a significant person in charge of that, remember? The Apostle Paul, he's called Saul then, but he's in charge of Stephen being executed. And so Stephen, instead of cursing or condemning Saul, he looks up to heaven, gazed steadily into heaven and saw the glory of God. Yes, God's glory will come to us. And he saw Jesus standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. Jesus stood up for Stephen. And Jesus is standing up for you right now. Paul writes about it in Romans 8. It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Now this is written by the guy that executed Stephen, right? <laughs> and saw Stephen look up and see the glory of God. See, God's working in greater ways. That's a greater thing to get Paul to be converted, right? Stephen knew that. And God worked that. But who do you know? Who do you know that will stand up for you 24-7 in all circumstances, no matter where you are or what you are doing. No one person can be with you all the time. But Jesus is. I love it, that great hymn of the church, Martin Luther, a mighty fortress is our God. He said it so well in that hymn. Did we in our own strength confide? Our striving would be losing. 
were not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. Dost ask who that may be? Christ Jesus, it is he. We would be losing without him. The Ukrainian people would be losing without him. 80% of them are Christian. And they're trusting God in that great fight that they're going through. When you're facing conflict, where's Jesus? He's right there for you. When you're down and out, where's Jesus? He's right there praying for me. Say that. Where is Jesus? He's right there praying for me. When you are failing or falling, where is Jesus? Right there praying for me. When you're hurt and you're grieving, where is Jesus? He's right there praying for me. Yes, he is. He's right there. And he's given us the Holy Spirit. He promised that also in John chapter 14. I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate. That word is a beautiful word in the Greek. Advocate means somebody who will stand up for you. It's also a legal term. It means a, a lawyer who will argue for you in court. It means comforter. It means helper. It's a beautiful word. He will be with you. How long? Forever. This is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you and will be in you. Train your heart. Train your heart to see Jesus, to know that he's there. Yes, our advocate, the Holy Spirit's with us and in us, connecting us to the Father, as Paul wrote in Romans again. God who searches the heart knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes. Again, the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to His purpose. God is working in all circumstances, yes, yours and mine, for good for those who persevere and wait on him. Max Lucado, in his book, Unshaken Hope, tells about his friend Chris, who went through a storm when he was nine years old. Now, for a nine-year-old, the storm's a little bit bigger than maybe uh, the rest of us when we get older. But he was a rambunctious, athletic, and outgoing little boy. When he contracted mononucleosis and was told that he'd have to stay indoors all summer, that's devastating for a little boy. He was going to miss Little League Baseball. He was going to miss going fishing. He was going to miss riding his bike with his friends. This is devastating. It's like his world had collapsed for a nine-year-old. Well, his dad trusted Christ, and he was determined to try to help Chris through the summer, and he decided to buy Chris a guitar. And um, he uh, would show Chris each day a new chord and technique and told him to practice it all day. By the end of the summer, Chris could play Willie Nelson tunes, and he was starting to write his own music. In just a few years, he was leading worship in the churches, many churches, and he was recording his own songs. A few decades later, his songs today, his songs are sung more than any songwriter on the planet Earth. That includes secular music. And they are among the most popular on Christian radio. How can that be? It was all because Jesus was praying for him in his storm. And because of that, Chris Tomlin was able to find God's grace in the midst of his storm to become the most popular Christian songwriter ever. God is working for good, even in the midst of this horrific time in Ukraine. Right now, Billions of Christians, over 2 billion Christians, are praying for the Ukrainian people and for, uh, against Putin and his 
mere 200,000 soldiers. Who do you think is going to win? The Ukrainians, as I said earlier, 80% are Christian. They know how great and awesome God is. That's why they can get out there, stand in front of these tanks, and not be afraid. Because they know a Jesus who is standing up for them. When you know that, you can do all things through him who strengthens you. There are reports right now that a lot of Russian soldiers have abandoned uh, their platoons and companies. Because they weren't told they were going to fight a war. These were supposed to be maneuvers, practicing. They didn't know they were going to start killing people. And so a lot of them have left. There's been uh, a slowdown of this convoy. It stopped. There have been tanks and equipment breaking down. And even Russians are protesting. The number two Russian uh, CEO of, of the oil company in Russia, he's saying, stop the war to Putin. It's amazing. And the world is united in ways we haven't seen in, in decades. The world's united. NATO is united. People are coming together uh, like we haven't seen in a long, long time. God is working. God is working in all circumstances to bring good out of that in the midst of the evil for those who are called according to his purposes. These are Ukrainians. I really, really think they know that they are a part of God's great purpose to turn back evil and to establish a righteous government and peace. It's going to be a long, long, hard battle. They know that. But in the end, in the end, they know Putin's going to fail. And he's going to be judged by God. God's even working in ways I didn't expect in Ripley. Just last week, I learned of a young girl in Ripley, teenage girl, who had, had nothing to think about towards God. She was cold towards the church. She was cold towards God. She wouldn't come uh, to church with her mother. And she started watching all these events in Ukraine. And she realized that, boy, she needed Christ. She needed something stronger than uh, these... Uh, than what's going on in the world. And so she came back to Christ. And now she's listening to Christian music. And she's anxious to go to church and worship. Because she knows he's the only security. The real security in life. God is good. Do you truly know this Jesus? Do you know this Jesus who's praying for you? Are you walking with him? Do you trust him in your storm? Train your heart and your mind to see this Jesus. Because he is with you. And he's praying for you. To give you his power and unshakable hope. When you trust and wait on Jesus. You will behold his glory. And he will come to you just like he did those disciples in the storm, and when you behold him, you will bow down and declare as they did, truly, truly, you are the Son of God. Amen. Will you recite the promise? This is your promise for this week from Romans. Say it with me. Jesus is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that you're there interceding. You know what's ahead this week. We don't know, but we're thankful we, you do. And we're in your hands. We're going to trust you, Lord, in our storm. We don't know if a storm is coming this week or we know one will come sometime in the future. Some of us are in a storm right now. Help us just to to trust you, to know you come to us in the Spirit. Help us to behold your glory, to stand up for you, because you stand up for us. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Let us prepare to come to the Lord's table as we stand and sing, Be Still, Be still My Soul. My soul.
God is good and has amazing grace to offer us so that we can live boldly for him, to have our sins forgiven, to live and love like Jesus, to work for the righteous reign of God on earth as it is in heaven. And so we need his cleansing grace and his empowering grace at the table. He offers it freely to all of us who will come in faith and receive it. And we prepare our hearts to do this through our prayer of confession, and it will be responsive. Uh, you will have the part in bold blue. Lord, we confess our day-to-day -day failure to be truly human. Lord, we confess to you. Lord, we confess that we often fail to love with all we have and are, often because we do not fully understand what loving means often because we are afraid of risking ourselves. Lord, we confess to you. Lord, we cut ourselves off from each other and we erect barriers of division. Lord, we confess to you. Lord, we confess that by silence and ill-considered word, we have built up walls of prejudice. Lord, we confess that by selfishness and lack of sympathy, we have stifled generosity and left little time for others. Holy Spirit, speak to us. Help us to listen to your word of forgiveness, for we are very deaf. Come, fill this moment and free us from sin. Rejoice at the good news. If we confess our sins before him, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we remember on the night that Jesus gave himself up for us, he took the bread, gave thanks to God. He broke the bread and said, take and eat, for this is my body broken for you. And likewise, he took the cup lifted it up and gave thanks. And he said to his followers, take and drink, for this is my blood of the new covenant shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, oh God, we pray that you will make this bread and this cup be for us the very body and blood of Christ so that we might be the body of Christ for the world, your world for which Jesus came and gave his life. It's in his name we pray. Amen.
you to come and receive the holy meal. As the forgiven people of Christ, let us stand and rejoice as we sing our final verse.
winds and waves still know that Christ rules. Christ is watching you. Christ is praying for you. May you go in that assurance to give you unshakable hope. Let us join together in our benediction, our unshakable hope benediction each week. We are building our lives on the promises of God. Because his word is unbreakable, our hope is unshakable. We do not stand on the problems of life or the pain in life. We stand on the great and precious promises of God in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.